Welcome everyone to this session of our Launching Leadership Series. As you know, the purpose of our Launching Leadership Conversation Series is to highlight the accomplishments of our alums, featuring a fabulous group of graduates who are shining examples of an intellectually adventurous Mount Holyoke education in action. And I'm so pleased to welcome our guest today, two current members of our Board of Trustees, Mona Sutphin of the class of 1989 and Natasha Mahanti, class of 2003. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you a little bit about each of them and then I'm gonna jump right into our questions, our conversation. Um, but please be aware that I will be stopping so that some of you will have opportunities to ask questions as well. So we'll look forward to that part of the conversation. Mona was an international relations major and later earned a master's degree in international political economy at the London School of Economics. She has had an illustrious and varied career, serving for several years as a career diplomat on the staff of the National Security Council during President Bill Clinton's administration, and later serving as the White House Deputy Chief of Staff for Policy in the Obama administration from 2009 to 2011. She has over 20 years of experience advising multinational corporate, philanthropic, and institutional investors on the intersection of geopolitics, policy, and markets. Currently, she is a partner and head of investment strategies at the Vistria Group, a Chicago-based private equity firm with a focus on technology, including as the co-founder of several startups. And I've already told her I'm gonna ask her to tell us a little bit about what private equity is, in case you are wondering about that. Natasha was a computer science major at Mount Holyoke and went on to earn a master's degree also in computer science at UMass. After working for several years at Google, she co-founded Fem Inc an AI-powered video engagement and media analytics SaaS solution that offers content discovery, personalization, predictive viewing, and analytics for media and telecom companies. She's now an engineering leader at Stripe, a financial services and software company based in the Bay Area. Now, if you've been listening, you will hear two very different pathways. Um, uh, these two alums have had very different sets of experiences, but where they intersect is in the world of tech startups, and that is something we will explore. But let's start with Mona. Um, your career seems to be the epitome of an intellectual adventure, <laughs> let me just say. Global travel, politics, international finance, is this what you imagined when you were sitting in your interrelation, international relations classes? <laughs> Back 30 years ago. Um, so first, really glad to be here. It's really fun um, always to be on campus. And thanks for the great weather, ordering that up for us. Um, so no, I can't say that that is at all what I had in mind when I was studying international relations. Um, but I, uh, I grew up in Wisconsin, in Milwaukee, and um, in a neighborhood where people didn't really travel the world and I had always had this very strong desire to be in the world and not an observer of it. So I was always drawn to experiences and opportunities that would push those boundaries. So when I got to Mount Holyoke, that helped open up my whole world. So you got to Mount Holyoke, mm -hmm. a global community, yep. and very literally with students mm -hmm. from everywhere. Yep. Um, how did that story unfold? Yeah. You know, when you graduated, and then what? Yeah, so um, I ended up studying international relations. I studied Chinese. I was always interested in international related issues, but I actually have had um, uh, this also this interest in the creative side of my life as well. So I actually went into the advertising business when I left uh, Mount Holyoke. And my, my, I always tell people when they ask me, well, how did you end up going from advertising to diplomacy? And my answer is my professors at Mount Holyoke College. And I always say, like, my, I really owe my career to, the, to Mount Holyoke. Like, I would not be anywhere I would be today without that. Um, because I met some people who were very, very um, influential in my trajectory. And my, I had my campus job was with Tony Lake, who later became National Security Advisor. Mm -hmm. And he was somebody who kept on saying, yeah, I know you want to go into advertising, but, you know, you might want to take this 
Foreign Service exam, and I thought, I don't, I don't want to go into government. Like, there's no way I'm doing that. I'm, I'm not going to do that. He said, well, just take the exam. You know, it can't hurt, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's fine. Okay, yes, I'll go ahead and take this exam. Um, but I did go into advertising. I moved to Chicago. I'm working for an advertising agency. And then um, my wake-up moment was one night um, at about 2 o'clock in the morning, I was working and I accidentally deleted the entire column of my formulas in my spreadsheet that I was working on my advertising agency. And I realized I was going to be up all night. And I remember thinking to myself, there has to be more to life than selling, selling shampoo, which is what I was <laughs> advertising. Um, and literally, I don't know, maybe four weeks later, five weeks later, the Foreign Service called and said I had passed the exam and did I want to join. So that like led me into this whole path. And I said, oh, yeah, sure. And I wasn't even sure what it was, to be honest. I just thought, oh, it's, it's definitely not what I'm doing now. So. <laughs> It'll be an adventure. It'll be an adventure. Right. Definitely was an adventure. Right. Well, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. come back to you a little <laughs> okay. bit. But now let's hear from you, Natasha. Um, you received a degree here in computer science. So it's easy to see your connection to the world of technology. That seems like a pretty straight line in a way. Um, you started your journey at Google a little company none of us have heard of. Um, <laughs> tell us about that and your path to becoming a co-founder. For sure. Um, it's, I want to echo what Mona says, super awesome to be here. And I also want to say, like, when I started at Google, not, most people did not know Google. This was like, I interned there the year they IPO'd, so it was still like among, sitting here and like at UMass, no one knew what Google was. It's just a real startup. It was just like, um, at that time, like um, the recruiters that used to come to Mount Holyoke were like very heavily either banking or Microsoft was like the first tech recruiter that showed up here. And so Google was actually just like not at all here. And I'm actually super thrilled to hear these days, I hear lots of these companies come here. So very, very, very proud of Mount Holyoke's evolution um, through that. But yeah, so I think I actually interned at Google because Google was doing the, the, that time also wanted to encourage more, more women in tech. And so they had, a, they had like a scholarship program and I applied kind of randomly like that. And then they're like, yeah, you got the scholarship, come visit. And I was like, well, yeah, let's go. My roommate was also, is also a Mount Holyoke alum. She's like, you just, just go, it's California, you'll have fun, come back. I went there, um, that day they were like, you know, we're also looking for interns. Do you just want to do an interview and apply? I was like, well, okay, why not? Again, I have nothing to lose. Like, these are easy. And, you know, worst case, I just go back. It's all the same. And then I interviewed. And then they were like, well, do you want to come intern? And I was like, ah, I guess I'll go intern. Um, and then I had a lot of fun at the internship, which sort of what made, convinced me that um, I should go work there. But I do want to be honest here. Um, I was in a PhD program at UMass, and I did tell my professor for the four, for like four years after I was ago, I'm coming back, I promise you, I'm coming back. I, um, never did, but like, <laughs> it's one of those things where I feel like being at Mount Holyoke, like letting go of something that you're excited about is very, very hard. And I think I, it took me a long time to like let go, because I'm like, but I'll miss out on like whatever I could have learned. Um, so I think that, that was an interesting journey. The reason to kind of do the startup, I was at Google for about eight years and, um, I think there was a time when we, you know, our motto was like, never fear change. Mm -hmm. There was a slash in between, but I'll just not go there. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was pretty much the reason, which is like, I knew how to do this, like I could do it. Um, but I was getting a little bored and felt like I needed something else to stimulate me and try out something. Um, the way I sort of view it is if actually taking a, taking a risk, like what's the worst that can happen? The worst that can happen is you don't like it or it doesn't work and you come back to what you were doing, but I would always regret not trying something. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like deeply comes again from how Mount Holyoke, like the four years here. And so I was like, fine, let's do it. Um, and I was doing it with two other women. Uh, one was from Smith actually. Um, and our startup was very much about, you know, how do we change how women were represented in the media and use technology as a lever for that. And, and so how did that work for you? I mean, you know, in terms of getting started, I'm, I'm quite curious about that. Getting started, getting started, um, the early days of a startup are really, really fun. You sit in a, a room with people you respect and who are really sharp and like come up with cool ideas and then you're like, oh, I'm gonna go build this and I don't know if any of you are in tech, but like coding is actually fun. So going and building something that people can play with, really, really fun. So those were all the fun parts. Then there is the raise money and you know all the other sort of like logistics of it that from my standpoint, not the most fun part. 
Um, and so there was a bit of like up and down there. And then you're back to like when people use your product, I mean, there's no more thrill than like people using something you build. So super fun. Um, but like, so that was, I would say, early days was like sit in a room, come up with ideas, build really quickly, ship it, get people to use it, get people to give feedback. That was all the fun. And then there's the raise money and follow this and that. That was an interesting up and down journey. But if I would say like it was very brutal at times, really thrilling at other times, but I wouldn't have had it any other way. Which leads us to you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I know, I, I know that feeling. That's the roller coaster, I call it. Yeah. Yeah. So, Mona, I know you've been a co founder as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. So, tell us a little bit about that experience, how you got into that. Mm -hmm. But also, you are in the world of private equity a mm -hmm. funder. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, let's So, now I've seen both sides of it, right? Yes. Yeah. Tell us about that. Um, yeah. So, when I left the White, I've been actually started up a couple of different companies, but the I've one very recent one and one slightly older one. Um, so when I left the Clinton the national security world the first time uh, and um, left the government, I went to a little startup in the financial services space in Silicon Valley. And I was the classic 19th employee in a garage <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> in the valley. Um, and I was going from government where you get a paycheck every two weeks and your social security is taken out of it and there's a number to call when you have problems mm -hmm. to literally nothing, flying with nothing. And I had to get used to the idea we lost a client that somehow the entire company, the bottom was gonna fall out. And so you, I've, I've used to say, I don't know how you guys live on this roller coaster because the highs are incredibly high. When you ship a product, you develop a product, people start to use it, You've never, it's never been so exciting. Um, and I was on the sales side and the marketing side, and you get the traction, it's so exciting. Um, and then, yeah, then the reality hits, and you have a setback, and then you think, oh my god, this is all going to fall apart. But it's very exciting, um, mm -hmm. very intense, very exciting. Um, so it's, I think, a little bit addictive, and I, there's some similarities with, with government, in a way. Um, I could get into if people are interested in that, in that um, it's complex problem solving in uh, not a well-defined space, so there's lots of room for creativity. That gives you a lot of satisfaction, and I think creativity is a really important part of the keeping your career going in a sustainable way. Um, but now on the other side of it, um, and I talk to founders all the time and give them advice, because now I'm on the other side of it, which is the capital raising part that everybody hates <laughs> so much. And if you know anything about private equity, everybody hates private equity too. Um, but it is, <laughs> it is the foundation, actually, of how most of the American economy has been built. Um, most of the most innovative companies originally had somebody who was willing to back them with money to get them going and understood what the vision was willing to go alongside with them, invest so that people can get their product to market, to get it to scale, to get it to the vision that ultimately the founders have. And that's what I spend my time doing now is actually looking at how the world is changing um, and where we should be putting capital as, as, as different industries change and, and how to foster that change and, and growth and development. I'm curious about the part you said that it's like government, and mm -hmm. I and I know you were alluding to that in terms of the creativity and the problem solving. But do you mm -hmm. want to say more about that? So, I think a lot of people when they're thinking about their careers, like what are they what are they good at? What do they like to do? And I think people don't think sometimes enough about who they are as people. They think about the job and not like what actually gives them excitement and happiness. And early on, one of the things I realized I was a little bit like Natasha. I needed to be challenged. I needed it to be interesting. I, and I needed it to be changing a lot. And that's, that's not like everybody. I mean, a lot of people I know don't like the idea that they go into an office and they have no idea what's going to happen to them from 9 o'clock until 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock. For a lot of people, that's very um, disruptive and very frustrating. They want to go and know what it is their goals are. They want to know what their day, how their day is going to unfold. And they would find it very distressing to have what I have, which is if I get to 10 o'clock and my day is what I thought it was and I'm feeling kind of dissatisfied somehow. So government, by definition, it, it, because it's dealing with the world around you, all the inbounds are, are coming in at 100 miles an hour. And certainly when you're dealing with diplomacy, you're dealing with other countries and what they're throwing in over the transom. So every single moment of every day is changing, just like a startup when you run into a problem at X or Y or Z. So it's problem solving at, at scale um, and for public good as opposed to for a technology or a product or an investment. Got it. That's yeah. my theory. Sounds like being a college president. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know it all too well. Yes, thank you. Um, 
Well, there's a phrase I learned from one of our alums, Sheila Marcello, who was also a founder of a company, yeah. uh, and she described what it means to be authentically bold. As she said in an interview, when you bring your truest self to the table, you are able to be bold in your own authenticity. And there's a lot of evidence of authentic boldness in the stories that each of you have shared this, this afternoon. So I'm curious to know, how did your Mount Holyoke experience help you find or deepen that sense of authentic boldness? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to start? You can. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, if you're ready. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm ready. Um, so I think the, probably the most important thing in this journey of figuring out exactly who you are and what you want to do and your ability to push boundaries was something that I didn't appreciate when I was here, like is often the case, um, which is that Mount Holyoke helped me separate my gender identity from my identity as an individual and that I did not, I felt like I was permanently that, that connection, which back, I went to college in the 80s, so gender stereotypes were still a very strong driver in career choice and career path, um, still is today, but definitely more so then. And I felt like that's, that, that connection was permanently severed when I was at Mount Holyoke. So I never felt after, in my career, um, constrained by how people might perceive me as an African-American woman walking into a space, even though in my career in national security, I often was the only woman and certainly the only woman of color for probably the first 15, 20 years of my career. So, um, and I, th I think that held me in very good stead because I didn't constrain myself on that basis. Great, thank you. How about you, Natasha? Where does that authentic boldness come from for you in your Mount Holyoke experience? I think for me what's interesting is to, the one thing I learned in Mount Holyoke is that it's okay to have questions and it's okay to like not be satisfied with what you have and always wanting more different something else. Uh, and I think that's held me in really good stead because sometimes, you know, say I was working at Google, lots of people asked me, it was a great job, why did you leave, right? And it wasn't because of anything wrong with the job. And I, I think it, Mount Holyoke let me kind of put that aside where like things don't have to be wrong for me to want something different. I could just want it and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And I think that was like a big, big, big step, right? Because until then, like I thought of my career as like, okay, you know, go to college, get a degree, then get a job, make sure you like pay back your you know, like loans. And it was all about like create a bunch of milestones and then like just try to like chip at it. And then suddenly you're like, okay, so I've achieved those milestones. like. Is it okay now or is it is it ever okay to be like, well, actually, I just want to go do something else. Um, and I think of Mount Holyoke and certainly all my um, all my college friends do continue to give me that strength. So whenever I feel like, is it, do you think it's okay to kind of like say no to this or say yes to that? I do come back to like college friends and be like, and they're like, yeah, it's totally okay. And I think that just, you know, kind of paved your own path and that's okay uh, came certainly from my time at Mount Holyoke. Yes. One of the things that I'm curious about relative to that paving your own path and deciding it's okay is that you're not running your startup now. You're back at, dare I say, a regular job. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so was that hard to transition away from? That's very interesting. So the reason I, ch um, I don't know if you guys, so I work at Stripe. So Stripe's, it's like a, it's a pre-IPO company, but like it, just because I think the company chose not to IPO, but it's like a pretty decently large size company. But we are growing very rapidly. And one of the reasons I chose to come to Stripe is there was a stage of company I had never had in my career. And this is the stage of company that like has figured out product market fit, but is like actively growing and needs to grow more lines of business if we mm -hmm. are to become like significantly bigger than we are today. Um, and so like last year, the company like doubled in size, right? So like I was like, I have not been at a, as a leader in a stage of a company of that particular shape. That's mm -hmm. actually why I chose Stripe. So it was to, to like get some other itch, right? Like I haven't done that. I'm going to go try that and see if I like it. And then, you know, if I like it, I'll stay longer. If I don't, I'll go create something else. Great. I know that in your own bio, and this is probably true for both of you, but I was particularly struck, um, Natasha, that a lot of your time, your free time, to the extent you have some, uh, is spent helping women develop, whether that's as coders or you know, basically building the pipeline of women in technology. 
Could you talk a little bit about that? I think lately I've done a lot more things from the other side, which is what do we do as companies or organizations to hire more women? I think there was a point when we used to discuss like we need a pipeline of women because there aren't enough women in tech. I think now we have established like that's a myth. There are plenty of women that can be in tech and it's actually we need to take a look at the other side and make sure that we have the right Pra hiring practices, the right organizational structure by which women will want to be in tech mm -hmm. and then will thrive in tech. And I think we can all agree tech's done a pretty crappy job of like encouraging women to join and then making them like actually happy um, in tech. So I spend now a lot more time on that side of like, what do we do to create a better environment than I am like necessarily drawing more women. Um, and a lot of that, I think some of the early work was very much like take a look at a lot of our interview processes and like, are we asking the right questions? Um, I'll give you an example. You know, engineering interviews are always pretty standard. We have a standard list of questions. We are evaluating a set of criteria. But it turns out that you can ask those questions in the context of gaming or you can ask those questions in the context of, um, you know, like social networks, or you can ask them in a different context. And depending on the context you choose to ask them, you will get people, you will get a different set of people applying, you will get a different set of people thriving. And so early Google interviews were all gaming related. Google's not a gaming company. We never made games. We will never make games. But it was just sort of like the early engineers were all gamers. They created an interview loop about gaming. Most of the women, when they would interview, would be like, I don't want to do this and I don't want to take part in this interview. So I think a lot of the work I've done lately is like, you know, just making sure all our practices are like truly diverse and by staring at like every, every single lever we have there. And then once women join, just like, how do we make sure they feel comfortable in this environment, right? And how do they feel like they have a voice here? Uh, and so a lot of like groups within uh, within companies on like, how do we make sure women have a voice? How do we make sure they have a sponsor, not just a mentor who will like fight for them in, when they are not in the room? So that's sort of where I'm spending a bulk of my time now. Great. I know um, in your case, Mona, you have had, as you said, you know, you were often not just the only woman, sometimes the only African-American, sometimes both, um, both in the world of finance, but also in the political arenas in which you were operating. I'm wondering how you see that shifting now. Yeah, I mean, I wish I could say it's getting better. It is getting better, but it's not great because of these um, unspoken barriers that are really about culture and how people value each other and what, what you see when you walk in the door. Um, and there's still a lot of embedded bias that is very difficult to weed out of the system. Um, and I see this a lot in, in investing, and I saw it a lot in government because there, in the case of investment, let's say you're investing, I don't know, $100, $100 million in a company, not shockingly, you're, you're worried about, okay, we need to make sure we get somebody who really knows what they're doing so that we don't lose all of this money. People have a tendency to default to people they already know that they have confidence in. So if all you ever do is default to people who are already in your network and the person who's making the decision is, is less diverse, you're never gonna break that circle open. That's where I see, um, a lot of I, sp I spend a lot of time, at least certainly as an investor and elsewhere, just really probing those. What I see is a bias, which is just oh yeah, that's the first person you reach for, but it isn't the only person actually who can do this job. It's more mm -hmm. that it might take a little bit longer to to meet the person and realize no, actually they have a lot more to bring to the table, mm -hmm. um, and that's hard work. And there's a lot of pushback in in the corporate world on on the, some of those things. So yeah. Um, so yeah, so we spend a lot in my firm. We spend a lot of time challenging. Um, assumptions about around race and diversity and we push all of our portfolio companies a really hard way and sometimes um, you know if people don't want to do what we want them to do then they don't end up you know being invest we don't inv end up investing in them because they're not on board with our view of how society should change so, that's great yeah <laughs> um, I fun. know I have a lot more questions but I know that we've got an audience of students who are here in part because someone said they're good Questions. They have good questions, so I'd love to. Um, Pressure's on. <laughs> yes, I'd love to open the floor to our audience. Yes, please stand up and introduce yourself. Um, hi, my name is Liz. I'm a senior, um, majoring in computer science and East Asian studies. Um, and my question is, what did you do to just to sustain yourself as um, a gender minority and or a racial minority in industries where you're underrepresented? 
How did you sustain yourself? I'm glad you chose the word sustain because I think a lot of the initial years was very much keep your head above water and what does what would that take. Um, I, I think like I would say my early years were very much sustained by the relationships that I made at Mount Holyoke, right? Like the like, well, I'll just be honest, right? Like you go to work, you put on a bit of a persona of like, okay, now I'm a professional and I'm just going to treat everything professionally. Then you come back to a safe space and then you scream with like the people, you know, <laughs> like what in the world was that? And so you need those people that you can be like absolutely real with. Um, and then that allows you to wake up the next day and be like, I can, I can do that. So I think a lot of that early sustenance came from there. But I would say like after like three, four years, I'm like, actually, why should I take it? Like, why should I? Why should I, like, deal with this instead of just calling people out in the most nice way? Um, and got a lot more, I guess, comfortable in my own skin that I do belong. And I belong enough to actually call people out if they say something that, that, that you know, didn't work for me or they, that bothered me. Um, but I would say it did take me, like, three, four years to get there. But now I'm like, yeah, you know what? I am here and I'm, I'm not going to deal with crap. So, so be it. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree on the, I still have a, a group of people that I feel like you always need a safe space, both for that sustaining kind of community of people who actually really know you and know, and can also be the people to call, call you out and say, are you really, are you sure that step makes sense? Because I don't think it does. And they're willing to, they, with love, say what, what they think it is you need or what you should hear. So I think it's super important throughout your life, really. Um, and but even more at the early parts of your career, because some of it is this question of, yes, how do you assert yourself in the workplace in a way that is, is authentic and comfortable? Um, and you need to bounce that off of people. So just advice from peers is super helpful. And I always tell people when they're looking for mentors, I'm like, you want a mentor who's a couple years ahead of you. You don't want a mentor who's 30 years ahead of you, because the person five years ahead from you actually just went through whatever you went through, successfully or not. Um, and people spend too much time looking at for mentors that are way, way ahead in their careers. Um, so I just give that a little bit of advice. But, um, but on the, I, I think on this question of like asserting yourself in the workplace, like Nancy Pelosi always says, it's about like know your value, you know, and asserting yourself. It's a very difficult thing to do. It's like it's, it's because you can, you can, you you have to figure out a way to do it where you're authentic, where people will respect it, where you feel like you're you're. Um, doing it in a way that's productive for you and your career and your identity and all the rest and that you are dealing with a, whatever the fallout might be and so it gets to your self-respect and all the rest and learning how to how to articulate that in an effective way so I think it still takes time I see it even in my career now I, it's it's always front and center it comes up all the time you get better at it as you go on other questions yes um, hi my name is Nora I use the two pronouns I'm a senior uh, politics major um, and I was wondering, one thing that intimidates me about leadership and becoming a, a workforce leader um, is sort of the idea that when you make mistakes, you, the consequences are bigger. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit in your experience, like when you're doing problem solving at scale, like what happens when you mess up? Yeah, I got a whole riff on making mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> I Go make mistakes it. like oh, so up so the, yeah, all the time. And I've made some mistakes like I, I won't get into like one time I made a really big mistake with Obama and he was like, I cannot believe you made that decision without consulting me. I was like, I'm really sorry. <laughs> and he's like, and I would not have made it. I'm like, even worse. Like, okay, great. Um, one is I think a lot of times um, if you're 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 gonna make mistakes. So that's that's just like the way it is. I think that owning up to a mistake before it gets bigger is a big problem that people have in life. They double down when they believe they've made a misstep instead of realizing, like, I, I need to put this out on the table. And so I used to see what were small problems, the worst three words when I was in the White House was always like, I, I have this problem, I tried to fix it. Oh no, that's a terrible, that's a terrible thing. So I'd say, Part of it is have your stakeholder group when you're making decisions and feeling like you're, you're, you're consulting with people, it softens the blow later. Particularly if you know what the risks are of when you're making a decision or you're, making, you're doing something, you realize there, there could be, this could be a mistake. And if you, you name that and you bring that forward in the dialogue, it's much less painful later than if you hit it all and then suddenly this, is, this thing is a disaster and you didn't tell anybody. Right, so I think a lot of it, it gets to like just yeah, framing what the risks and, and con risks and rewards, upside and downside, are of any decision helps a lot. Um, and surrounding yourself with people who are you know honest, 
brokers. So. I, I echo all of that. I mean, I think like, I, like you know, own up and like, sort of like, I would say right now, like it's also my job to create an environment where people feel they can own up, right? So like if I don't own up, they won't own up and then we'll all be much worse off for it. So I think just that's a huge part. But I would say one thing that I think I've struggled with, which is forgiving myself for the mistake. Like I hold on to my mistakes oh, yeah. very that, right? deeply. Yes. <laughs> And I think the, I would say as I get older, one of the things I'm like, it's okay. I, it's true when I say people make mistakes, I am one of them that, that like, and give yourself some grace for that. Because I think if you hold on to like, I made this mistake, so I will not make these decisions, that will really hold back your career because you keep having to make decisions. You just have to figure out how to like, let that go. For sure, you have to make decisions. You yeah. have to continue. And you never, and you never get one hundred percent information. So you always are making decisions before you're fully comfortable making them. By definition, <laughs> in life. Yes. Hi, um, I'm Louisa. I'm a sophomore. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Um, question that I have is, if you could go back in time and give one piece of advice to the version of yourself that you were when you were at Mount Holyoke in our age, what would you say and why? Advice to your younger Mount Holyoke self. I mean, I think um, I got this <laughs> advice when I was at Mount Holyoke. So when I, a lot of, um, when I joined Mount Holyoke, I was an international student. And a lot of international students were majoring in like computer science and economics. Um, and I, I was like, oh, maybe I should go do that. And then one of my professors was like, why? You should major in something because they make you major in something. After that, just have fun. I think that was the best piece of advice. I didn't think I had that much fun. Um, so if I were to go back to my past, I would tell my college self to have more fun, take all the, like, take all the intellectual stimulating classes that are like nothing to do with computer science. Because like over time, I end up, I ended up specializing and specializing and specializing, and it's really hard to find like time and resources to learn about international relations, um, I, or psychology. It's just much harder. Um, so I would just tell my past self, like, take all the courses that like don't have anything necessarily to do with the immediate career. Um, but will be, you know, something you'll hold on to for the rest of your life. Yeah. So I might have actually a little bit like the opposite advice because I was a student that <laughs> <laughs> I was a student that was um, on everything. I was on social probation like three of my four years. I was on academic probation for a little while here and there. Like I had definitely had a struggle <laughs> taking my academic self seriously, and I feel like I missed out. With, and I, I, didn't, I didn't have a major for a long time, and I eventually had to do a little Venn diagram to figure out like what major can I have here? Like what do I, what do I need to take to kind of graduate? And I was really worried that I was not gonna graduate because I didn't have enough PE credits, so I literally, <laughs> I, had to, I had to do a sport my senior year so I could have enough PE credits to graduate. It's like, if I have to tell my parents I'm not graduating because of PE, <laughs> like it's ridiculous. So I would say a little bit of the opposite, which is, if I had been less flitting around and a little bit more intentional, I, I wouldn't give any of it up though, right? I wouldn't do it over, but I think I, it might, I would have told myself like, okay, a little less of the running around, you know, multiple other people's campuses at two o'clock in the morning on a Thursday and more, <laughs> more paying attention to what I was supposed to be doing um, would have been good. Well, Plus all nighters at the eleventh hour and all that. So yeah. This leads me to ask you a question, which <laughs> is um, because you went on to get a master's degree from the London School of Economics, which is not an easy place to be admitted. Not, right? So how did that happen? Yeah, so, <laughs> exactly. How did that happen? I do not know. No. I so my, so I went back to graduate school after being a diplomat for almost. So I I, I was in the Balkans during the war, and then I. Um, after, after the war ended, and I had some, a free year, basically. And I thought, okay, I really, at that point, was doing something that I think I probably should have done at Mount Holyoke, which is I actually really want to learn more about what I've been up to in this space, even though I was an international relations major. Mm -hmm. And I was really interested in the economy as well. So and I could see already how the economy and politics, how they fit together. So it was really intriguing. And I'd say it was the first real sense like that an academic space is the best place to learn this and not just getting out in the world because as I said at the outset my desire was to get and be in the world so the academic experience of observing the world was was not naturally appealing but then suddenly it became really necessary and very interesting uh, for me to put the context to what it was that I was actually seeing and how I was how I was moving in the world so yeah so I got serious about it great 
Yes. Hi everyone, um, I'm Mia Lulian, I'm a junior, I'm a computer science and mathematics style major. Um, and my question is, we talk a lot about identity, um, like in the outside, like we are, you know, women, non-binary people, gay, lesbians, um, but often, like you said, I don't have the dice to say this within me, like I'm just me, um, but I fear that like, as you step into a industry that reminds you constantly that that is who you are, is how do you separate society's identity from who you are. Okay, I'm going to repeat a little bit for people who might not have heard fully. Um, what I heard you say was that, you know, if you're in an industry that's constantly reminding you of an identity that may or may not be what you have deeply internalized, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but that, um, but you're constantly being reminded of it, how do you manage that? Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Ah. Yeah. I mean, I don't really, Accept it, I guess. I just kind of go through. You can observe it happening, but I, I intentionally go right past it. Um, but there is, a, there, is uh, there are certainly circumstances where people will not take you as seriously because of the way you look. That's just the reality of it. In the old days, I used to do before the internet, before Google, I used to do this thing where I would, with client, corporate clients, I would intentionally have a phone call with them before they ever met me. Because nine times out of 10, almost every professional situation I've been in, even, even with women and people of color, when I walk into the room, often people will ask me to get them a cup of coffee, often people will ask me where the bathroom is, people always ask me in the store where the shelving is, always, 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 100%, every single workplace I've ever been in. And in the old days, you could get by that because then there would be the shock when they'd realize, oh, you're the person I've been talking to about this substantive thing for three months and I'm finally meeting you. And I, you can see in their face that they're clicking through their mind like this is not exactly what I expected. But at a certain point, it's on them. <laughs> I mean, that's, it's really, it's like, that's your problem. I call it a YP, right? That's your problem. Like, it's not an MP. It's not my problem. So, um, and you can have that hold you back or you can just say, you know what, if you're, you just have to keep going. And you can't let that get in your, in your mind too much and start to psych you out because it's really their issue. Yeah. I don't know if you agree with that. But. Uh, no, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I think I was sort of like semi-protected from it while you code. Like, it's just, it is meant to be a, like not personal in that way. And so, you know, there was some, some ability to hide within work to kind of be like, you know, that got harder as you could sort of rise the ranks because then you don't code as much. Um, I think one, some of the advice I was given is like, well, you are in the minority, but guess what? They'll always remember you because there are so it's few women. True. So every meeting is like, instead of using that as like, okay, then maybe I shouldn't say anything. I was like, well, when will I get this hundred people? And they'll all know my name. And it's true. They always know your name. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of it is like, you know, yes, it, it's, I think this is where like the having your own like people really helps because you literally go into these rooms and like take on a different mental model a different persona and then yeah from a career standpoint don't let they don't let it hold you back and like to some extent they do like they will know who you are because there are so few of you and so like i was like I, that, that was it was great like use it to your advantage but it is exhausting and so you do need to like come back and like let like allow some space for yourself to be whoever you are um because it is exhausting to kind of like fight some of all of that but you know from a actual career standpoint it won't hold you back if you if you kind of like don't let it. And I, I, just to chime in, I actually think it's easier when you have an international career, like as a di diplomat, I always found that my, as, as a, somebody who's a minority, going into a foreign culture, like I was used to being the, uh, different. So it wasn't strange to be different in then some third country, whereas everybody else was really struggling with this idea that they were different. And so you realize that's just part of your skin, that's what you get used to, and you, can, you definitely can play it to your advantage. So. Great. Way in the back, I see a hand. Hi, I'm Hannah Eskowitz, I'm a senior art history major, Asian studies minor, and I was wondering sort of what are the hardest skills you guys have had to learn over the course of your career? Um, what are some skills that we here at Montpelier can could really start to build and start to learn um, as we look towards the future, um, and whatever comes next? Hardest skills. Um, I think from a, as a computer science major, I, I would say like we had a good computer science program, but I did struggle quite a bit in the actual technical part of it. So I did spend a lot of my early career just like reading up. I think where Mount Holyoke was a big leg up is as you moved up, 
they really you really care about like synthesizing things together from like 50 different whatever readings or documents into a clear clear articulated plan did a lot of that in college do that every single day like every single day it's like oh my god there's a mess here there's a mess here how do i synthesize this and turn it into a, an action plan that like 100 people will then go follow um so i feel like that a lot of like the the reading the writing workshop <laughs> i feel like have held me in very very good stead as uh, even in a super technical career like how do you articulate whatever you want to say whether it's in an email or like a long form thing i think that's been um sort of i would say the biggest big 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 learning so for me i think the one of the biggest challenges was public speaking in a particularly in a large crowd format not not this size but like much bigger um or or even significantly bigger where um and when you go you know, if you ever do press interviews where making a mistake is is more consequential so be very careful with what you're saying and how you're saying it um and feeling comfortable in your skin speaking in public is not something actually you do it might do it in class but it's different when you have to do it in front of your peers or in front of a workspace or even with the broader public so i'd say that's a skill once you once you start to master it um and you can start it obviously in in class and one there's lots of little tips i think that are easier to pick up when you're just coming out of school that make it much easier than if you just suddenly have to do it at 25 or 26 and you haven't really had a lot of practice at it um so speaking arguing writing folks i'm sure are happy to hear all of these things <laughs> yes other questions yes Oh, my name is Tahini. I'm a senior. I use she her pronouns. Uh, I'm an architecture and math major. Um, so speaking of identities and interaction in intersectional identities, um, when is a moment that you actually felt empowered in the identity that society has told us that makes us underprivileged or pushed back by? I I don't know if I can point to a moment of of when I think I think it's for me I feel like the journey was a lot of like it took me a while to realize that people are putting me in a box right like so I think you come out of college and there there are no or very few boxes if any and then you're like oh I'm a free spirit I can do whatever I want however I want to do it and then you kind of go along your merry way and then you're like oh damn that something is not working like that is doesn't make any sense so i will tell you like it took me a long time to even realize that there was a box happening that like what and what those parameters were um and then to then process it and then kind of figure out like and be empowered by it i think i spent most of my career just like ignoring it right so i i i wouldn't say i was like terribly empowered by it outside of like in very tactical things just being like but like my work will speak for itself and you know all of that i in the place where i truly started to embrace it was when i realized that like i am a role model for other people and if i don't embrace this then like what am i actually saying for you know women that come after me that like and i think that was when sort of like i guess something clicked in my head being like okay you actually need to stare at this and be like you know i am actually pretty comfortable with who i am i don't you know very comfortable and i start to own it and i think that i i would say the moment was like you know quite a bit stemming from realizing that like other people are looking up to me and my ignoring this is actually kind of telling them that do you that's what you need to do to be successful and that was never the intent so i think just like that clicked on me and then i would say the second place was um when i my i have two kids my older one's a daughter and i think that was the other place where to some extent a lot of it is like now i like i have to do daily role modeling and like really try to embrace like i really want her to be whoever she wants to be and not feel like there's any box and i have to like truly embrace who i am for her to feel like comfortable with who she is so i would say that's the other place it really like hit me in the head yeah did no, you want to add no 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 you can you no, yeah are you sure yeah yeah no go ahead Hi, my name is Rebecca Yetoro Alvarez. I use her pronouns, and I'm just so grateful to um, hear this conversation um, because this this is a conversation on leadership. I was wondering when you guys start to see yourselves as leaders, and how that has evolved throughout your career. So, I mean, I, I'll I'll tell you a story of a like a serious leadership moment. But um, one way you start to realize that you're a leader is when you go to things and people start to ask you for advice. you know younger people come and seek you out for career advice or in a more subtle way but there was one moment where i realized like wow okay i guess i'm a leader so 
Um, early on in the Obama administration, there was a woman, Melody Burns, who uh, African American woman who ran domestic policy, and she and I had a meeting, and um, you know, was, we were talking about something we were going to do. And at the end of the meeting, there was a conversation about, okay, what are the next steps? And we talked about it a little bit, and then everybody stopped talking, and they started looking at me and her. And then she and I realized, like, oh, wait, we're, we're the deciders. <laughs> like, we realized, like, oh, wow, there's nobody else to decide. Like, there's only us, or you go to the President of the United States, that's it, right? So we were like, oh, wow. And afterwards, she and I both said, we pulled each other aside and we said, how crazy was that meeting where suddenly, for the first time, everybody is stopping and waiting for us to make the decision. That's when you realize, like, okay, I guess this is, this is on, right? <laughs> we're making decisions, and we're real, we're real leaders. Um, yeah, it was a very telling moment and very funny because we didn't we didn't really even see it coming. I think a lot of mine will, will like be very much on the same. You only view it through other people's eyes. Like you just mm -hmm. you don't think of it as yourself. It's just like you sort of a reflection of like what people think of you, and then you're like, oh damn, okay, <laughs> I, I better like say things, write things, or be careful. And I think. It, yeah, I mean, it's even little things right now where I'm like, I used to be very casual about things, and then I realized people actually take it very seriously. I was like, I'll be like, oh, I think we should go do this, and suddenly like five people are working on yes. it. Yes, I kind of did not mean that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, you say, oh, that's kind of interesting, and yeah. then you find out, wait, like ten people went for a year to go, like, because I said, oh, I thought it was interesting. Like, no, 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 don't do that. Like, that's a bad idea. Yeah, you got to come check, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's when you realize that, like. The, 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 the price that you must pay as a part of that is be a lot more deliberate about what you are saying and what you want done. And I think sort of that's when I've had to flip from like, these aren't my friends. I mean, they're really nice people, but they are looking up to me. And so I need to be more careful and more thoughtful about everything I'm like saying and doing. Um, but I, it just didn't occur to me to like things were just happening and then I'd be like, oh my God, that was not what, at all the intent. <laughs> I'm thinking of a quote I heard, um, read once, that said, leaders are like eagles, they don't flock. Is, is that, um, you know, I was thinking about what you just now said about, you know, how you had to be careful, they're not your friends. Um, you know, as a, you know, is, is leadership lonely? Extremely. I would say it's very lonely. I think, I mean, well, I don't want to say leadership. I feel like my current job, I'm very lonely, and it's one of those... Um, one of those like active things to spend time on like making sure I have built some relationships to make that happen. I think some of it is like everyone is also busy, right? So like you, you can't tell all your doubts to people who report, who look up to you. Right. Um, but like the other people you would share those with are very busy taking care of their people. And so you end up being, yeah, I would say. That's, that's yeah, it's something we observe a lot with the CEOs in our portfolios. We own a bunch of different companies. and. Um, one of the biggest challenges is a lot of leaders are facing similar challenges, particularly now. Obviously, there's stress related to the pandemic, a lot of culture related questions in the workplace, a lot of thinking through the world is changing like so fast, and that it, it, it weighs on, on people heavily. Um, and what, we, what you find is people are so lonely and they're carrying all this burden themselves, and there's really nobody to talk to other than people who are going through it similarly, right? So you, you do have to find similarly situated people that with enough time um, to, to be able to get some back and forth. Otherwise, you really do run into a, the risk of being, feeling like you're by yourself flying alone, which is, you know, not, not great, obviously. Right. I know I've been looking at this side of the room, so I want to come over here. Go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm Tia. I'm a sophomore and I'm studying with computer science and math. And so my question is kind of a two-part question. Like the first part is that like when you were in college and looking back on when you're in college, wait, are you everything you envisioned you would be right now? Mm -hmm. And like if not, like how do you deal with the idea of changing changing your plan and like overcoming to make it something else and not to like shorten the growth in a sense? So that's my question. <laughs> changing your plan. Oh yeah. I'm a big fan of that. <laughs> <laughs> I came to Mount Holyoke to major in astrophysics. So actually, the, one of the reasons I left, so in India, I actually could do really good well in computer science. So like they had, they, there's a lot of technical colleges, but one of my motivations for coming to the United States was to get to a liberal arts degree, but also like study astrophysics. Uh, and I did actually, I minored in astronomy. So I did like study astronomy in college, but I feel like I'm <coughs> almost like a year in plans already changed. So it was 
pretty sort of like plans will change. I would say, I don't know. But, I mean, I think like, yeah, I, I, today's young people, I feel like think a lot further ahead. I had only thought of like, I need to pay back those student loans and I just need a job that will let me, that was the extent of my, my plan. So to some extent, like I hadn't thought it all out and I feel very grateful for where I am today, but it was like no part of it. Like I hadn't like thought that far out. So maybe that's why I didn't. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. I feel um, today's graduates are under a lot more pressure to define what it is they want to do, to, I think, very early. And I see a lot of people getting caught in what I would say a little bit of a cul-de-sac early on in their careers where they get stuck on a particular path because it was either the easiest one or the most logical one or the most rewarded one from the LinkedIn profile, et cetera, et cetera, um, as opposed to thinking through, do you know, what, what, what am I good at? And you really only know what you're good at when you get into the workforce because it's all relative to somebody else, right? And so I think it's really important to just always be, I always was questioning, I would always look at my boss's boss's boss and say, do I, do I want to do what this person is doing? And if the answer was no, then I knew I would never, I would not be there for the long haul. And then the next question was, what are the skills that I need to get in this role? And every year I have an anniversary, I still do this to this day, every year, same anniversary, I say, is this, have I, have I accomplished basically everything I think I can accomplish at this place? Have I learned everything that I'm, am I starting to see the same thing over and over again, two, three, four times? And if I am, I, I really have to force myself to say, I think it's time to move on. And you really have to create that structure in your mind because it's very easy to get just on a conveyor belt. Um, and for, whether you stick with what you're doing because you love it or you don't, at least you've had this check-in about what you're, what you're enjoying, what you're good at. I want to echo what Mona said. I feel like when I was in college, I assumed like career and life growth is linear, right? Like it's just, it's a straight line and must go up to the right. And then you realize in reality, people who have, you know, accomplished a lot, it is not, their paths are rarely linear, right? It'll go up, you know, like take a twist and come back, right? Um, and if you're not comfortable with that, it'll be harder. Like the local <coughs> minima problem is like absolutely there. And so I think like just to take a step back, like most people's career in the world is not linear and that's okay. Mm -hmm. I know we have another question in the front row. You had your hand up earlier. Yeah, I did. Um, my name is Ramatsu. I am she, her pronouns, and I'm a senior majoring in international relations. Um, and one question that I had is kind of long, but it's more like if you go into like the workforce with like certain values or beliefs that like you know like like they like they, they won't change, right? How is it like navigating like being in a setting where you have to make a compromise that, especially being like from marginalized communities, it, like you are more. Um, I guess what, like looked at and watched. Um, so was it hard to like just set boundaries on those beliefs or values that you have, and like not having to compromise it to advance in your career? Or like, how hard is it to like not lose yourself in the leadership um, dream? Yeah, I mean, I think this is it's it's actually very important, a very serious question because the reality is in the workforce, just in life generally you're gonna compromise a lot because you're meeting people halfway and any workspace you're in, any relationship you're in, any, any interaction with other human beings, right? You're kind of trying to meet people halfway and find common ground or not, <laughs> or identify whether there is common ground or not. Um, and in the workplace, obviously the stakes are higher because you have a job, et cetera, et cetera. So, but the way I've always seen it is there are red line elements and then there are other things where um, People live their, live their lives differently, et cetera, et cetera. The good thing I think about at least the United States today, and certainly global, if you do end up doing global work, is um, I think people are much more accepting of difference than when I first went into the workforce. There's not an automatic assumption of assimilation to a particular way of being. And I, I do feel like there's more um, value seen in a diverse perspective than there used to be. Um, and so, but there are certain, certain red line things where you, if, if, if those are crossed, you, you just can't feel comfortable in the workplace, right? And you have to get, you have to get yourself out of a situation. And I would say, if you know, you're truly miserable and you feel like this is really eating at the fundamental identity of who I am, it's making you really, really unhappy. And chances are you're not going to be that successful in that gig anyway, right? And if you're not going to change it, you, then the question is, am I going to try to change it or am I going to go do something else? That's also a really hard decision, right? So... Um, but mainly it's just staying true to yourself is the way I, the way, at, at that really core, like what's a red line thing as opposed to what's, you know, in the gray area. 
I totally echo that. I mean, I think do not, I, well, my safe answer is do not take jobs where you think there's a chance that there will be a red line that you will be uncomfortable with because it is a lot to deal with. And personally, there are lots of jobs out there that don't have that red line. And I feel like any organization that has that is not worth my time. And I'm like cool with that. But at the same time, if you are in an organization that ha does a lot of good, but is also doing things that are challenging, I think you have to ask yourself if you have the stamina to m drive through that change because it's never going to be fast and it's never going to be easy. It's probably worth it, but it, you'll have to like really dig in and be like, I am, I am ready and willing to like, you know, make this happen because of I believe in all the rest that the, 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 that organization is doing. And then once you compute the ROI and you're like, I can do it, then I mean, then like I'll, you know, more power to you. Um, but there are moments where I'm like, well, there's no way I'm gonna go be a part of that organization and there's other things that are better use of my time. Mm -hmm. And I really wanna thank you both for being available to this audience and to those who will see the video this afternoon. Um, just thank you so much for your generosity of time and effort. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.